All right, we come now in our study of biblical ethics to the three basic questions of ethics. The three basic questions of ethics. And keep in mind the principles we're giving you will help you understand the practice of ethics when we get to the second half of this course. The history and the principles are absolutely vital, you see, for your understanding some statements we'll make later. The three basic questions of ethics, biblical ethics, in fact, all ethics, all ethical systems, philosophy, religions, are concerned with these three questions and the varying conceptions of the solutions to these questions is what constitute the different kinds of philosophies and religions and ethics. You see, the answers men give constitute the various systems of philosophy and so forth, religion, ethics. What are those three questions? You can just categorize with the answers. You can just categorize every system of philosophy from Socrates right on down to present-day social gospel by answering these three questions. What, first of all, what is the highest good for man? That's the basic question of all religion, ethics, and philosophies. What is man's highest good? Now, religion, philosophy, and ethics. I mentioned those three, but I won't keep saying the three. I'll just say ethics, and I'm summing up... Uh, it's understood that all philosophy and all religions have some moral or ethical emphasis. Religion, philosophy, and ethics are concerned with man's goal in life. Concerned with man's goal in life. Now, it's important you get down as much as you can this morning in dealing with these three basic questions, and I'll go as slowly as needed, because I feel like almost everything I'll say will save you asking questions later. We're dealing with this first question, what is man's highest good? What's his goal in life? <clears throat> See, man is aware that he isn't what he should be. He's aware that a higher purpose exists than the one he's attained already. So the chief concern of all religions, philosophy, and ethics is to answer what then is our purpose in life, our goal? What is the highest good? It's called in ethics a sumum bonum. Well, I can tell most of you haven't had a last, and that's why you laugh. Sumum bonum, highest good. You read that. We didn't assign you in ethics books, but some of you may get to reading in some ethics. I haven't found one that wouldn't confuse you because when they get over, some of them, even Christians, uh, good conservative Christians, they get over to non-resistance, they say, well, uh, we can justify a righteous war. America's right. And <laughs> so when we get over to one's responsibility to government and state, uh, I wouldn't want any questions. Well, the author said thus and so. So I haven't found a good book on ethics. If we run across one, we will, we'll recommend it. So the chief concern of ethics, religion, philosophy is to answer the question, what is the sumum bonum, highest good? What is man's chief end? What's his purpose in life? Now whether or not you know it, I don't care who you are, saved, unsaved, charismatic, non-charismatic, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, you're, trying, you're wrestling with that question. You're trying to achieve the highest good. For you, it may just be pleasure. I don't mean anyone here, but I'm saying you out there, world. <laughs> Anybody. It may be the highest good may be becoming a monk and hiding away somewhere from the world. It may be getting busy in religious works like Southern Baptists do. It may be seeking first the kingdom. You know, I mean, every... <laughs> Everyone is 
is dealing with this question. So you can see we're dealing with everyday life. What is our purpose? What's the highest good? Everyone has a goal, even if it's a Hitler. His goal was to make the Aryan race supreme, you see. He, had, he saw that as the highest good, to eliminate all the defectives of the world and make the Aryan race the exclusive race. All right, second question, and we'll be looking at these one by one. What is the standard, the norm, the final authority for what is right and wrong? What is the f standard, the norm, the final authority for what is right and wrong? Is it God or reason? Is it God or your intellect? Is it scripture or popular opinion? Majority opinion, of course. Is it the scripture? Is it majority or popular opinion? Is it custom? Education, philosophy? What is the standard or norm or final authority for what's right and wrong? Can we just go by our inward intellectual convictions? Or is there something outside us that says, do this and don't do that? This is right or that's wrong. Is secular education enough? Can we teach men how to be good? The world and uh, social gospel churches say yes. If you educate a man, he, if he knows to do right, he'll do right. Well, remember Socrates? He said the wise man was the man who had knowledge. The fool was the ignorant man. That if a man knew to do right, he'd be righteous. If he knew to do right, he would do it. So you can see where the philosophy of secular education and even much of the church comes from. Now man's conscience tells him to do right. But it doesn't define what the right is. That's the task of biblical ethics. Man's conscience says do right. But it doesn't tell him what the right is. Now you see there, we could just stop right there and spend the rest of the time. You've got a conscience, but it has to be educated. Your conscience will excuse you if it's not educated. All the conscience says, do right, don't do wrong. That's the voice of God within. But, but he doesn't tell you what the right is. A man is by nature moral, but... In order to make right moral judgments, he has to have a certain standard or norm or authority to measure his conduct by. Man is by nature moral. But if he's going to make right judgments, he has to have right teaching. He has to have a standard to measure his conduct by. So that's the second question of ethics. What is that standard? What is that final authority? After, there are a lot of authorities that tell you what to do or what not to do, but what's the final authority? Is it the scriptures? Is it God? Or is it what? We're told morals change. What grandmother thought was sin today is seen as uh, just a lack of proper understanding of mores and the psychology of the human mind and social issues and all of that? Or is there a final standard if, if something is wrong in Jesus' day, would it still be wrong today? Is there something we can look to that won't change with the philosophies or the teacher or the educational institution? So what is the standard for right and wrong? Now, all you have to do is pick up the magazines, newspapers, listen to radio or TV reports, and listen to 
the answers to this. You hear it all the time. Well, you know, uh, I'm broad-minded. I believe that uh, we ought to let a person express him or herself the way that he feels good or right about it. Is that freedom or is that really bondage? The only freedom the Bible speaks of, as we already know, is taking on the yoke of Jesus. He said, my burden is easy, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. But it is a yoke, it is a burden, being a disciple. The third question of ethics, philosophy, and religion, is man completely free? Is man completely free to choose and act morally and ethically? This problem concerns the freedom of the will. It's really a theological question, which we've already dealt with in theology, but we put it in here for completeness sake, and this will probably be all we'll say about the third question, but we'll say more about the first two. The problem concerns the freedom of the will. So what I say here will sum up what I'll probably say on this third question. We're, we're asking, is a man really free, or is he controlled by fate? Or is he predestined to act as he does, and lacks real freedom of choice? The answer to that, the scriptures show, and as we've already shown in biblical theology, the answer to that is the scriptures show that man is endowed with a measure of self-determination. Self-determination is another word for freedom of the will, freedom of choice. He can determine for himself what's right or wrong. He can make his own choices. Therefore, because the scriptures say he has a degree of self-determination, therefore he's responsible for his attitudes, Motives, actions, conduct. You see, the idea of a standard or a norm, a standard or norm of conduct by which a man ought to regulate his conduct would have no meaning apart from the fact that man has the power of choice. See, the idea of a standard a final authority which ought to govern man's conduct would have no meaning apart from the fact that he must have power of choice. Because whatever is not self-consciously willed has no moral value. Whatever is not self-consciously willed has no moral value need to get down as much as this as you can because everything we say in this whole course will be based on these principles. Whatever is not self-consciously willed. See, a cow can will to eat, but he doesn't do it self-consciously. He doesn't say, now I'm a cow, there is hay, I think I shall eat some hay. <laughs> but you self-consciously do that. Which one? <laughs> About the self-consciously willed has no moral or ethical value. It has value, but not moral or ethical value. You see, a tree cannot be convicted of homicide if it falls on a man and kills him. <laughs> a hawk has never been taken to court for, for robbing a sparrow's nest. See, he wills, they will to do that, but not self-consciously. Morals and ethics are not involved. A lion may kill a kid or a cow, but no one ever charged him with murder. So what isn't self-consciously willed has no moral value. Therefore, man must be free to some extent. Because when we praise or blame a man for something he did, see, some acts we praise, some we say, He's to be blamed. We do so on the assumption that he voluntarily made that choice. 
You wouldn't praise a man if he had no freedom of choice. You wouldn't blame him. You don't blame trees, sparrows, lions, hawks for their actions, which sometimes are not pleasant to watch. My grandfather lost his left arm from a tree, but no one ever suggested taking the tree to court. See, there's no moral, voluntary action involved. So when we, he can blame the tree, but not morally or ethically. So when we blame or praise a person, we do so on the assumption that whatever we're blaming or praising was done voluntarily. Now in conclusion to this third question, let us add that, that biblical ethics would say that apart from the new birth, apart from the new birth, man is incapable of realizing the highest moral and ethical good. Because in his freedom to choose, he always chooses self and sin. That's right. That's right. Amen, that's true. Even though it looks like outwardly a good moral action, he doesn't do it in the dark. Right. He'll get on TV and say how he's going to spend his spare time as a movie actor campaigning for contributions against cancer, muscular dystrophy, and that sort of thing. Now, if he'd have said he was giving four million of his money, he would still have been bragging about it, but I might be a little more convinced that he was, his heart was in the right place. Anybody can get on TV. Raquel Welch uh, is the uh, chairman of the crusade against cancer. I don't see any connection, but it's, it's, hardly, it's hardly a good deed when one broadcasts it all over the country. But anyway, in man's freedom of choice, he chooses to sin. That's obvious. Bith biblical ethics would say, would conclude that apart from the new birth, it's impossible for man to realize the highest moral ethical good. He'll strive after something. He, he may find it in humanitarian works, humanitarianism. He may dedicate his life after he's made enough to retire for humanitarian projects. Dedicate a chair in a college to his name, let somebody else contribute to it. He'll give a thousand, and then you know it'll be uh, subscribed for fifty thousand to support the teaching of that particular class in a college or university. A lot of people spend their lives at things that uh, are not the highest good, because apart from the new birth, you can't realize it. Now we'll answer what the highest good is in due time, but it, we have to get to it. Scriptures tell us what it is: the highest good in life. All right, now let's look at these questions individually. First, what is the highest good? We'll look in detail now. That's the basic issue of life, as we've said. The various systems, religion, ethics, and philosophy can be classified according to their attempts to solve that question. What is man's goal in life? What is the highest good? We'll look at some various solutions. Now, there are a lot of them that we could give you. I'm just going to deal with some of the more obvious ones and show how it's right in the middle of Christianity, too. What is the highest good? What's man's chief goal in life? That's the question we're looking at. We'll look at some of the attempted solutions. First, we'll look at the American, American ethic. The American ethic. And this is the ethics of pleasure. See, we're going to be dealing with the practical issues of life in this course. There isn't any course more important for people than this. None, none are unimportant that we teach from the Bible. And all this has already and will be right into the Word, you see. So it's not apart from it. 
This will help you understand why people think the way they do, why the church strives after ends that are not the highest end, and that sort of thing. And they use the utilitarian, pragmatic ethics of the business world to get things done. Results are what counts. Who can argue with results? I mean, last year, for only 540 in Sunday school. Look this year, 680. Now, who can argue with that? We must be pleasing God. We must be building the kingdom of God on earth. Look. <laughs> Results. Well, Ezekiel never would have made it, would he? <laughs> God said before I send you, nobody's going to listen to you. They would, they would come in his house and stare him down into the floor. And he'd just go right on prophesying. God said, don't be afraid of their faces. He told Jeremiah that. Don't be afraid of their faces. I wonder why I said that. Have you ever been in a pulpit preaching a strong message? <laughs> Praise God. I, I can say almost without exception that uh, this is about as near to the heaven on earth you could get for a minister. Amen. Faith Assembly Glory Barn. But it isn't perfect. <laughs> because occasionally you've got baby Christians are visitors and I don't criticize any visitors here because it wouldn't have to be true of you but it is true of some they know no more about what you're talking about and all they, all, they, they don't understand a prophetic message and friends everything that's taught and said by a charismatic ministry that's, that's moving with the spirit is prophetic right. prophetic isn't predicting the future prophetic means that person's a spokesman for the Lord. That's what a prophet is. It's thus saith the Lord. And uh, they've never been in the Word. They've never been in a church where they heard anything but John 3.16. Or they've been allowed to believe what they want within limits. And so, um, to get back to the ethics of pleasure, this will help you understand how the church got the way it did. The American ethic, the ancient designation for the ethic of pleasure was what? That's why we gave you the history, first of all, in this course. Hedonism. Hedonism. The ethics of pleasure. Are called by another term. Epicureanism. Because Epicurus was the one who founded the philosophical school that said happiness, pleasure is man's chief end. If he isn't, can't make himself happy, life is a failure for him. And they meant enjoy life to the hilt. Aristotle came along, of course, and had the golden mean, don't do anything to excess. But Epicurus said if drunkenness and orgies Whatever makes you happy, do that. And if that isn't the American philosophy, I don't know what is. The pursuit of happiness as an end in itself. The ethic of pleasure. Now, there are two types, individualistic and universalistic hedonism. Two types, individualistic and universalistic hedonism. And remember, Paul deals with these people in Acts 17, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now, let's give you some principles. Get down what you can. Individualistic hedonism, first of all. The American ethic, the ethic of pleasure we're talking about. The pursuit of happiness and pleasure is the American goal in life. Pursuit of happiness and pleasure is the American goal in life. There's nothing outside that that Americans strive for. All training in school, all advertising is geared to make you happy. Uh, anything that would make you unhappy is to be avoided at all costs. So the pursuit of happiness and pleasure is the American goal of life. The American is taught and trained to think in terms of avoiding all discomfort and pain and to pursue happiness as an end in itself. Being happy is the reason for his existence on earth.
Now let me just parenthetically add, we, we don't even have to say this, but let's parenthetically say it anyway. <laughs> we believe in being happy and full of the joy of the Lord. So we're not talking about the Christian ethic of blessedness and happiness. You can be going through a severe trial and have God's peace and joy. I've, I've had that. But as we get into this, you'll see it's not the same thing at all. We're not against being happy. <laughs> but happiness is not an end in itself. Something else is the end and goal of life, and that'll make you happy. So being happy is the reason for your existence here. The highest good in life is the individual enjoyment of the greatest amount of pleasure. You don't believe it? Where have you been? You've never heard an advertisement. You've never been to school. The highest good is the individual enjoyment. We call this individualistic hedonism. The highest good is the individual enjoyment of the greatest amount of pleasure. If life fails to give you this, life's a failure. That's right. Your career, your training, your job, your profession, your home, your education, your church, everything's supposed to make you happy. That's the goal in life. And a person who isn't, who is to the place where he can't feel a pain because he's so doped up with drugs, you see, he's unhappy. Therefore, he's missing what life is offering him, happiness. So the ethic of pleasure is the American way of life. Avoid discomfort at all costs and seek, seek happiness for its own sake. Let me give you some four instances. You're to avoid discomfort, we said, at all costs and to strive after happiness and pleasure. For example, the medical and drug professions labor to mask sickness, pain, and suffering. This is the American way of life. People in Europe have learned to, uh, I'm, I'm not even thinking of regenerate people now, I've learned to live with a little pain. Uh, why, the first thing an American does if he has a little bit of a symptom of a toothache or headache or cold, he runs to the medicine cabinet. And the church highly recommends that he does. Medical and drug professions labor to mask the reality of sickness, pain, and suffering. And the undertaker, by cosmetics and perfume, seeks to cover and mask the reality of death. Oh, that would be unpleasant to look at a corpse. That would be, make you unhappy to have to wrestle with a little pain or symptoms. Of course, within the faith message, that's the walk. You know, you do have symptoms that you have to wrestle with occasionally, and you build your faith in that way. But even within the church and charismatic circles, you know, the faith message isn't that popular with a lot of people because, well, after all, it's so easy to take a pill or a shot and be on my way. Look how I could be serving the Lord instead of back there battling symptoms for two or three days. Well, you could do like some have done, just go on anyway. Uh, I'm giving you some examples of the American ethic of pleasure, how it seeks the ethic, the principles of this ethic is avoid discomfort, pain, anything that make you unhappy at all costs. Mask it over, hide it, pull the window shade. Uh, in another way, you see this in the secular educational institutions. They teach the ethic the American ethic as the only way of life. The only way of life. All training in your schools from kindergarten through university, college, is directed toward one goal, happiness and pleasure in life. Now these are things that are not even debatable, friends because that's right in your Christian schools as well as your secular. But we're talking about your secular educational institutions first. All training in life is directed toward happiness as an end in itself. They don't teach you to follow a career that would make you unhappy, do they? 
Again, the U.S. government ships the American ideal abroad. American ideal, remember, is happiness and pleasure. See, no other nation majors on pleasure like we do. And they ship that abroad, the American ideal of life, through movies, TV, literature, government programs, and billions of dollars in gifts. Say, look at us. We're giving you these billions. That must mean that this is the way of life. And you poor downtrodden people over there scrubbing along trying to make a living, scratching out a living on a mountainside with some goats and grapes. If you just do what you see in our movies, you'd have two cars in every garage and a number of wives. But anyway, even our government ships the American ideal of happiness and pleasure. They, they never go beneath the surface on anything. No, they don't. Not, you, as I say, these things are not really debatable. Some people may want to, but they're not really debatable. If you've just lived 18 years or longer, they're not debatable. You know it's true. Then the Christian philosophy in the institutional church and schools. Here's another area. The Christian philosophy in the institutional church and schools presents Christianity as a life of joy and happiness. What church did you ever attend or school did you ever go to you were taught anything about bearing a cross? Deeper life in the spirit. Discipleship. Trials. That we must by much tribulation enter the kingdom, Acts 14. Ever been taught that? I got in trouble teaching it in a Christian school. I got in trouble teaching what I'm telling you. And of course, they, this is seen in the fact that uh, they are re they're really presenting the American ideal because even in Christian schools, I've been in them, I've attended them, and I've taught in them. They teach that, that life is, they teach the ethic of self-realization, uh, that you're to develop self-confidence, self-esteem, self-respect, pride, all of that's taught. Everything is geared toward your becoming a well-rounded personality. The whole Christian educational program is just secular education with a religious garb, in a religious garb. That's why anyone who knows the Bible and knows ethics would be in trouble in your average institution. I mean, they, they follow the customs of the world. You know, everything that will make you happy. The same holidays, same community activities. They're involved in all of that. You're to eliminate anything that would make you unhappy. You're to avoid pain at all costs. They teach that God's methods of healing today is through the aspirin bottle. They don't even give you other options, you see. The church doesn't. But no teaching on the deeper things, discipleship, trials, and so forth. And then again, most of your radio, television, magazine, advertising is directed toward realizing the American ideal, the American goal. Most of your advertising, friends. See, we're helping you now to think for yourselves that you hear and look at these things. And you'll see that it's all directed toward the American goal in life, pleasure, happiness. Pleasure for its own sake. That is the end. That's why you're here. You see, even your box mix substitutes <laughs> and your frozen foods. Now, there's an area where frozen foods is an advantage. But think of what I'm saying. You don't realize, you know, people are so shallow in their thinking. And I'm not saying you here. I'm just going to say people. 
But you know, and I praise God for it, he's always given me the gift or ability to stand back objectively and look at things. I can analyze people. I know people better than they know themselves after talking to them for a while. It's just the gift of God, I guess. But I can see in box mix. That's why I'm always bringing it up. I kind of make a little, little joke out of it, but in the box mix substitutes and the frozen foods and all of these things, uh, modern day developments of technology and electronics uh, appliance and, uh, appliances and all that the housewife uses, you know what that's for? To give her free time to achieve the American goal, happiness and pleasure. And so they whip up a box mix where it would take two or three hours to bake a cake. <laughs> Don't ever bring me box mix cake. I can spot them two blocks away. Praise the Lord, there's somebody here that's doing good works. I haven't even met her that brings me the real thing. I haven't even met her yet. Uh, she even rings the doorbell and someone else answers the door. The real thing. Uh, she makes a cream cake that uh, <coughs> brings back boyhood dreams of... <laughs> That's her body ministry. She's contributing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, that's a part of it. But she remains anonymous. I don't even know who it is. They've told me her name, but that's all. Well, if she's here today or anyway, if you know her, uh, thank her for me. <laughs> but you see, even the box mix substitutes and all of the technical, technological improvements are designed toward freeing the family from the drudgery, quote, unquote, of just daily life, automatic dishwashers, you know, the whole bit. And I'm not knocking using an automa automatic dishwasher. I'm saying you the, the purpose behind all that is to sell you water skis, motorboats, <laughs> Budweiser, you know, to, to live it up. It's to give you free time to get your... Um, I was trying to think of the name of that uh, mobile home that everybody drives around. Winnebago, yeah. <laughs> See, you're literally swamped. You, you watch this now in all your advertising. You are literally swamped summer and winter with recreational ads. Now, that, that is new to our culture. That's the American culture, and that's new even to us in the last, say, 25 years, 30 years, where that's all you get is recreational ads, specialty food ads, drink ads. I mean, as the song goes, when you say bud, you've said it all. <clears throat> I mean, you can write a book on the psychology and ethics of the American advertising media, and some have undertaken to do this. I don't have time to read it because I know what they're saying. I mean, I know the principles, but it'd be worthwhile reading. Read some of Nader's books along this line. Um, yeah, but wiser, but if you drink it, it should be called, well... <laughs> but dumber or something. <clears throat> but the I <laughs> No, you won't be wiser. You'll be dumber. <laughs> but you know, they mean that. When you've said bud, you've said it all. That's the end in life. Just to get a bud and <laughs> they even have it on the T shirts and all. The idea is presented that that a man, a man works. You have a career as a doctor, lawyer, housewife, whatever you work at. You're, a man works to do one thing, to get money to buy pleasure. Right. See, that is the American way of life. And he has, he has transported that all over the world. Our culture is influenced. Your, your juvenile delinquency and all, America is responsible for that in the other cultures, Japan and China and other places where it was unheard of, disrespect for parents, 
been imported through the movies, television, the literature. And it goes in by the tons every day. All right, we'll close with universalistic hedonism. It'll only take a minute and then we'll be done. That's individualistic hedonism. Universalistic hedonism is the same thing, except it's universally applied. Universalistic hedonism. It's sometimes called utilitarianism. Utility, utilitarianism. Now, universalistic hedonism is applying the same principles to not just individual enjoyment, but to everyone. The, this philosophy commends those actions which bring the greatest amount of pleasure to the most people. It's the same philosophy, but those actions are right which make the most people happy. Those actions are right which tend to promote the most happiness for the most people. Now, the founder of universalistic hedonism, that is the one whose name is given as the promoter of this, is John Stuart Mill. You might want his name. John Stuart Mill, M-I-L-L. -L. We criticize this by saying that that actions are not necessarily right just because they help a lot of people, because they're useful. Utility is not the supreme goal in life. What works? Actions are not necessarily right because they help many people. See, such a philosophy of life could logically justify divorce, because that seems to be helping three out of four people. See, those actions are right that help the most people. See, this is in the church. We'll get to that next week. It's in the church because they say, well, whatever, whatever program we establish that seems to help the most people must be right. But it would justify divorce, mercy killing, taking the goods of the haves and giving to the have-nots. I'm always interested in the millionaires who are... The leaders, the liberals, liberal millionaires who are leaders in social movements, but I don't see them giving away their fortunes. Like the Kennedys. They made their millions through whiskey, but, uh, and they're always for the downtrodden and the oppressed, and that in itself is all right, but you never see them giving their millions. But it would justify taking the have from the haves, giving the have-nots. It would justify prostitution. It would justify cannibalism. If a ship were wrecked and preserve everyone's life, they ate a few. <laughs> or if a plane crashed. Sure. Whatever helps the most people is right, because the end justifies the means. You can find that right in charismatic circles. The end justifies the means. See, the principles... When you learn those, you'll see why people think and act the way they do. And that's why you see me so unperturbed about occasional criticism, because I know they are brainwashed with these philosophies. Speaking of justifying cannibalism, there was, uh, there was an article in the Reader's Digest where a plane crashed in South America, I believe it was, in the high mountains, snow, uh, they gave them up for dead, searched about a week, gave them up for dead. They were 70 days on that mountaintop. No food, just a little, a few candy bars and stuff, you know. When they finally, two of them worked their way to civilization, when they finally, that was 70 days. How many months is that? Uh, when they finally got helicopters in there and rescued them, most of them were still alive. And uh, in good physical shape. And the doctors knew that 70 days, you were long ago starved and frozen to death. And they said, how, how did you survive? You didn't have any food. They said, we ate the ones that died. Well, and the priests 
of the church there and the authorities and most of the families of the ones they ate approved it. Utilitarianism, universalistic hedonism, the end justifies the means. That action is right which helps the most people. Some families did not approve of it. I could see why. Well, shall we go to lunch? <laughs> Couldn't resist.